Okay, so our next speaker is Michael Forrester from the University of Nottingham. Uh, he can probably tell us uh, the answer to Alan's question about what they call the Nottingham model in, in Nottingham. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about simulating functional connectivity and a next generation neural mass model of a human cortical network. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kyle, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'll talk really, uh, I mean, this is really a story of, of two networks. So um, what I'm, I'm doing is considering um, the anatomical uh, structure of the brain um, and also the, uh, what we call a functional network. Um, so anatomical structure is, uh, I guess, kind of self-explanatory. Um, so uh, this network here is um, derived from diffusion MRI imagery. Um, and that's where um, you look at the, uh, the diffusion of water in the brain to um, determine where uh, you find white matter traps. And um, each of these pixels uh, relates to the density of um, the white matter traps between two areas of the brain. Um, and then anal uh, analogous to that, we've got um, a functional matrix. And uh, this is derived here from uh, MEG data. So that's when um, you look at uh, two regions of the brain and uh, they'll generate some um, some signal uh, based on the uh, on, on, on magnetic um, signals um, generated by uh, the electrical activity within the, within the cortex. Um, and again, you can you can look at the connections um, pair pairwise connections uh, based on um, correlations between those uh, those two time courses uh, for the magnetic signals arising from the brain. Um, so these are both the uh, empirical. Um, um, th these are empirical data sets, um, but what we really want to do is to provide some kind of a mathematical computational foundation um, that allows us to, to input our structure into some kind of uh, so some mathematical model and, um, and allow us to, to generate a, a functional network that, uh, that resembles what we find in empirical data. Uh, and this kind of links back to, to what uh, Alan was saying at the, the end of his talk about um, what, what, the, what are the important uh, markers, kind of what, what, the, what are the features that we can put into this model that, uh, that are very important for generating uh, functional connectivity? Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the crux of what I, I'm interested in. Um, so, so I'll briefly describe what, uh, the generic network model. So we've got our structure, which we can um, uh, put into a matrix, uh, a weighted connectivity matrix. And this just defines the, uh, the long range coupling in our model. Um, we use a mean field reduction. So rather than considering large populations of neurons, which is uh, kind of um, sort of inf not really feasible for, for, for computing large, uh, large networks. So we consider mean field reduction. So this is, uh, uh, we just track the, um, the average population activity. Um, and we typically consider excitatory populations coupled to inhibitory populations uh, with some self-coupling. Um, and, and this could be described by, uh, for instance, Wilson Cowan or, or indeed uh, the Nottingham model, <laughs> as Alan uh, suggested earlier. Um, so how, how best to fit um, these models to functional connectivity? Well, we could consider her heterogeneity. Uh, and I've just highlighted two papers here where uh, they do just that. So um, in the top paper by uh, Deco and colleagues, um, they consider each of the, the nodes in this network to be um, to have different intrinsic frequencies. Uh, and in um, the bottom paper there by uh, Demirtas and colleagues, uh, they consider um, the, the, um, the intrinsic, um, the, the inter-population coupling strengths to be different between each, each node. Um, and this is important because you know, we, we know that different regions of the brain certainly operate differently, um, but in our models, we prefer to, uh, to use uh, homogeneous networks. Um, and the re reason for this is, firstly, we're mathematicians <laughs> and it's, it's much easier um, in terms of mathematical analysis when all of the nodes have the same um, intrinsic uh, model properties. Um, but also it allows us to kind of expose the, the, uh, the role of the, the topology because we know if we, if we decouple everything, all of these nodes are going to operate in the exact same way. So all of the sort of um, the differences between um, the correlation uh, between the nodes comes directly from the, the particular type of topology that we're putting into this model. So it allows us to sort of explore a bit more um, about the role of the, the topology 
and how the intrinsic dynamics kind of can be used to explore how we can excite uh, different network states. Um, so we had a first look at, uh, a, a, we, we looked at this first in, in, this, uh, in this paper uh, that came out last year. Um, and the aim here was really just to, to see how much of the, um, the kind of structure function uh, relationship we could um, predict or sort of determine uh, by just analyzing the, the single node model. So again, it's a homogeneous um, neural, neural mass network. Um, and what we found was that when we, uh, when we just looked at these function similarity, so we, we computed the, uh, the function by a pairwise correlation between uh, the node's time series. Um, and if we moved in parameter space um, and we just chose two parameters, a 2D parameter space where um, A is the um, amplitude of the um, excitatory uh, response to input and B is the uh, inhibitory response. Um, and this is the, the, the Janssen Ritt um, model, by the way. Um, and uh, but but really, I just wanted to illustrate that um, if we if we just have this homogeneous um, model, and we we move around in this parameter space, we can excite lots of different uh, networks which vary in similarity between the, the underlying structure. Um, and if we overlay the bifurcation diagram, so here just uh, in in panel A. Um, just overlaid the bifurcation diagram where the solid white lines are the hot bifurcations, the dashed lines are saddle node, um, and in black are a particular kind of, um, not, not really bifurcation, they're actually called force bifurcations, but um, they, they really relate to when the, um, the, the waveform of the oscillations change their, their um, form from a double peaked wave uh, to a single peak wave, um, and the, the, um, this black parameter, um, bifurcation set arises from a uh, inflection point within the wave as it as it moves between those two um, those two types uh, and we find out those particularly important because um, just around the sort of neighborhood of that uh, force uh, bifurcation set we see um, a very low um, structure function similarity and then we can look at the um, we can relate this to the stability of synchrony in the network so um, Using a, a weakly coupled framework, we can derive the uh, fa uh, phase interaction function for the network. And uh, looking at the stability of synchrony um, in that network, and again, this is um, completely, this doesn't care about the topology, this is just in a, a globally coupled network. But nevertheless, we find that uh, stability of synchrony relates quite well to where we see um, a very low. Um, Structure function similarity. So here, negative uh, negative parts of the, this parameter space are um, um, unstable synchrony, and positive is stable synchrony. So when we have unstable synchrony, we see very low structure function similarity. But I've, I've really just included these results just to um, sort of illustrate the fact that you don't need a um, sort of complicated analysis of, the, of all the network interactions to to understand the network um, emergent network response. Um, you can actually say quite a lot about the, the network dynamics just by studying the, um, the nodal dynamics. Um, but what would happen to this if we use a, an even more complicated model? So this is the answer, a phenomenological model. Um, we wanted to move on to more complex um, models such as the, the uh, next generation neural mass model. And that's what I'll um, describe briefly in the next part. Um, so we start with the um, the Montbrio, uh, Pazzo and Roxanne model. Um, and this is where the sort of uh, the first kind of iteration of the Nottingham Mo model, I suppose, uh, came from. Um, so, so this was um, developed from a globally coupled network of quadratic integrated and fire neurons uh, with pulse tile coupling uh, given by this function S of T. And uh, what the authors did was uh, they made uh, two assumptions. To get the uh, to get a mean field reduction in closed form, uh, the first was that they assumed that the um, the states of the um, neurons in this um, population followed a Lorentzian distribution, and the second was that the drives to these neurons also followed the Lorentzian distribution, um, and that allowed them to uh, solve the continuity uh, continu continuity equation, 
which is there at the top of um, of oscillators um, by exploiting the pole structure of of, of these Lorentzians. Um, and that allows you to reduce all of those uh, complicated dynamics in infinite dimensional dynamics into this very simple uh, two dimensional um, OD system where R is the firing rate and B is the, the, the average membrane potential. Um, so this is where the Nottingham part of the <laughs> Nottingham model comes in. So this um, um, in, in 2019, Stephen Coombs and Arnie Byrne released this uh, paper where they added um, synaptic dynamics uh, to the model. Um, so they included this uh, synaptic con uh, conductivity variable G, um, which was uh, which is governed by this um, this uh, uh, differential uh, differential operator Q, um, and that relates the synaptic conductivity to the uh, to the firing rate of the of the population. And this has recently been uh, augmented uh, in a paper that's just come out this year. Uh, where they've added uh, gap junctions, um, they also have added gap junctions to the model. Uh, so this is given by a simple ohmic law, um, where we just consider a, uh, a gap junction coupling uh, kappa v um, and the uh, difference between the pre and post synaptic uh, potentials bj and vi. Um, and this allows us to um, get a, a sort of augmented version of the of the Montbrio um, model uh, with these synaptic uh, Conduct, um, reverse potentials and the um, gap junction coupling uh, for, for just a single population. So now we need to uh, expand this to the network. Um, so we consider um, some local uh, dynamics, so within node dynamics, um, and we just have a, a differential equation as we had before. Where we have this differential operator Q. Um, and and the um, and coupling uh, cap A B, uh, and the A Bs here are just um, subscripts describing whether we're talking about the excitatory or in inhibitory populations. Um, but then we also have to consider the the non-local dynamics given by the the long range connections. And here it's uh, it's it's simple just to um, consider additive coupling. So rather than giving every single connection its own um, synaptic conductivity variable, we just give each node kind of a conductivity variable describing um, this, the synaptic activity um, of all of the external um, incoming um, synaptic potentials. Um, so this finally, uh, oh, and also it's quite important to, to note that we only consider coupling between um, excitatory populations. Um, because generally in the brain, the, the long range uh, dendritic connections tend to uh, be excitatory and not inhi inhibitory. So, um, but it, it's just a way to, to simplify the model a bit while uh, respecting the biology. Um, so this uh, allows us to um, formulate the, the final version of the model, which um, seems a, a lot more messy <laughs> than, than, the, than the initial version, but it's really, um, it's got all the ingredients uh, that we've described and uh, we just have these um, subscripts A, which describe the, uh, the population that um, we're looking at, and which is, um, receives input from these populations B. Um, and we also include timescales uh, tau A to, to, uh, to characterize the, um, the, the, the timescales of, um, of activity. Um, so now we've got our nice uh, network model, uh, we want to Come up with some some useful applications for it, uh, and the first thing we thought to to try was um, to see if we could understand anything, um, <laughs> understand what, how um, how TMS might operate in the brain. Um, so when we first went to clinicians saying, well, well, we've got this this network model, it's got all these biophysical properties, uh, they were very interested in seeing if we could understand anything about uh, how TMS works, and t t TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, it's a non-invasive um, treatment for, for conditions such as depression. And it's essentially um, pulsatile um, pulses of, uh, of electromagnetic um, fields instant onto the scalp. Uh, but they find it, it, it's, it's quite an, uh, it has a lot of efficacy in treating these, these sorts of conditions. So they're very interested in what, what sort of mechanisms might be, um, might be behind its efficacy. Um, so 
we we um, started by just um, driving the the network model, um, and so we started with some kind of some initial conditions. Uh, we gave we gave the um, the model the structure, and it, it gave us some function, which we derived from a pairwise correlation between time series, um, and then we um, we tried to stimulate different nodes in the network to see what kind of uh, functional connectivity uh, changes we could see. Um, so when you talk to clinicians, that they're very interested in sort of TMS protocols, and they find that the the results they get in these uh, in empirical experiments is very sensitive to uh, what protocols uh, they use, such as the, the frequency of, of, of TMS pulses or uh, the target site. So we, we focused on, on changing the target site and we found that we could generate very different um, functional connectivities based on which target site we were we were looking at. Um, so we thought we, we decided to take a step back and see, well, we, we know we can generate all these states, but um, can we generate very biologically relevant states? Um, so we thought, OK, let's try to um, to simulate the, the most basic um, sort of baseline state of the brain, the, the resting state data. Um, so that's what well, we talked about for the remainder of this talk. Um, so uh, we started by adding a bit more biology to the, to the model uh, by including delays. Um, so for these external connections, uh, we just considered a, a small delay on the uh, on the incoming um, firing firing rate, uh, which is given by this these tau ij um, parameters, and they're just the the path the the average path distance between uh, between nodes uh, divided by some universal uh, conductance velocity v. So what you can do with these uh, with these delays is you can actually excite um, oscillatory patterns. So if we start with some steady state. We can add delays, and this uh, changes the the stability of the system to generate delays. And we can play the same games before and, and generate functional connectivity patterns um, using these delays. But then we really want to see, oh, well, if we if we can generate these patterns, can we um, sort of prime the model using some some analysis to to kind of predict what sort of patterns uh, we expect to uh, to emerge. Um, so we did some linear analysis um, and because of our assumptions of, of this network being homogeneous, uh, it allows us to reduce the problem quite a bit. Um, and when you uh, work out the Jacobian for the entire network, um, the, the actual stability um, is given by this, these, this block um, diagonal form. Um, and each block is parameterized entirely by um, by the eigenvector structure of the uh, connectivity matrix. So expect the, these, um, these eigenvectors or, or eigenmodes um, to be intrinsic in the, in the patterns that we excite in the system. Um, so by, by solving this Jacobian, you can see these um, eigenmodes initially are, are very close together um, and the, the first eigenmode sits just behind the seventh, so I've just picked two eigenmodes just to, as an example. Um, and then after we add delays um, on the on, on in the panel uh, on the right, you can see that the, there's many more um, eigenvalues that appear, but uh, importantly, we've shifted the order of these eigenmodes. So now um, eigenmode seven um, is in front and falls just beyond the um, the, the imaginary axis. Um, so we refer, refer to this as, as exciting an eigenmode, um, but now we need to sort of test whether whether this is uh, predictive at all of, of what we see in simulations. Um, so if we prime the model if at a point where we excite just a single eigenmode, we can do this uh, cosine similarity on the eigenvector to to generate a pattern um, that we hope will. Be, uh, be similar to the, the functional connectivity pattern um, that we see in simulations. Um, and indeed, we, we get a very similar pattern. So just, just by eyeballing these, these two, um, these two uh, matrix outputs, you can see that the eigenmode 
um, is does resemble um, quite closely uh, the result of the, the simulation. So this is good because this means that our, um, our linear analysis is predictive of the um, of the, the functional connectivity we see in simulations. Um, but now we've got the challenge of actually trying to um, to find eigenmodes that resemble the empirical functional connectivity, um, and then being able to excite them in the model. Uh, and this is <laughs> this is really the the, uh, the challenge that that we have at the moment. So so if we look at the uh, the eigenmodes, uh, we find that uh, quite very few of them actually seem to contribute to the um, to the FC. So if we if we just take an eigenmode and see the error between the um, empirical functional activity and the eigenmode and take the mean squared error um, and we compute this um, measure called the R2 norm and that just tells us um, how, how good that eigenmode is at explaining the variance in, in functional connectivity. Um, and the, the, the values aren't strong but importantly we only really see um, relatively few uh, eigenmodes, only three here that that contributes um, to any sort of degree the the, uh, the functional connectivity. Um, so so we can pick out one, and even even though the the, the fit isn't great, we can clearly see um, quite a lot of similarity uh, in the in the pattern that uh, in the eigenmodes, which is the top panel, and the empirical functional connectivity, which is the bottom panel. Um, so even even though it doesn't fit quite well, there's still um, there's still a lot of structure there that's clearly inherited from the the eigenmode. Uh, and then we can put this into a simulation. Um, so compute the um, the linear uh, analysis allows us to define these uh, these borders of stability in in certain parameter spaces. Um, and this allows us to to pick out where we expect to excite these modes of interest. So, for instance, we, we can look at the, this very narrow um, region here between um, the functional connectivity um, and compute the, the R2 norm as with, as with the eigenmodes. Um, and at the moment, we're not getting, <laughs> getting things that are, that are incredibly strong, but um, they're, they're commensurate with, um, with what we were seeing um, with, the, with just the, the sort of raw eigenmodes and the kind of fits that we were getting with them. Um, but the, yeah, but there are certainly challenges in the, in the future to try and to, to try and make this model better. Um, so the, the, I think the one of the most interesting ones is to see. I mean, we've got this uh, this model with lots of uh, biophysical parameters in it, uh, but which is the best as a sort of exploratory parameter to excite lots of different modes, um, and can that tell us a bit about uh, the sort of mechanism um, behind functional connectivity? Um, also, there's the actual uh, structural connectivity that we have is uh, is generated from um, from quite uh, from this diffusion MRI data. But there's quite a lot of um, of steps to process that before it gets into the matrix that we um, we put into the model. So um, what we're studying now is what's the best way to process uh, that structural data, the raw diffusion MRI, MRI data. To get a matrix that uh, best um, allows us to simulate uh, functional connectivity, um, and also if we have resting state data, um, we're we're obviously looking at the static data here. But um, in in real um, empirical data, there's lots of um, non-stationary features. So um, if you look at very short epochs of time, you'll see a very different functional connectivity to to another epoch. So it'd be interesting to see if we can possibly um, see some of those non-stationary features um, if we if we do sort of narrower time windows in our um, in our simulations. Um, and then of course we want to put this all all back into the TMS question again and see well if we if we can prime if we can trust the uh, the model to generate resting state data um, can we can we see now what happens when we when we simulate it with stimulate it with these uh, TMS protocols, and, and perhaps gain a bit more of a, an insight into into the um, mechanisms behind TMS. Um, so what, what one last thing that we're thinking of doing, which I'll just explain very quickly, is um, 
so the, the one of the first uses of the of the, of the Nottingham model was to um, to generate a, the beta rebound effect, where um, during movement you see this uh, strong decrease in beta band power, and then um, after movement the the, uh, the power rebounds. So you see a, a strong increase just after movement in in the beta band power, um, and the brain um, over over a long period of time. You, you tend to see these uh, these bursts. So rather than seeing this rebound effect, you just see these kind of uh, transient, very transient increases in beta power, uh, which are known as beta bursts. And um, these have uh, been proven to well have been shown to be a, a biomarker uh, for functional connectivity um, by looking at the the correlation of bursts uh, in different regions of the brain. So we're also looking at this as kind of a, another avenue to try and uh, to try and fit the model to, to functional connectivity data. But, uh, but that's something for the future, I think. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to say thank you for everyone for listening. And uh, I'd like to thank my supervisors, uh, Stephen Coombs and Ruben O'Day, uh, to Stan Sotaropoulos, who processed all the structural connectivity data, and uh, to Sammy Petros, who's uh, written all the nice codes to, to do all the, of the uh, delay uh, system computations. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'll answer any questions. Great, thanks very much, Michael. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? In which case, I'll, I'll lead us off. Um, so, in thinking about these sort of large scale extractions of functional connectivity from these kinds of data, they're obviously quite sensitive to the approach that you use, and, and most of these approaches have some sort of threshold. So, A, are your results dependent on how you do that? And B, Sort of in the back of my mind, I wonder, I worry, well, wonder if you're asking the model to do much to, to do too much to predict the eigenmode that you excite across the entire parcellation of the brain. Do you have any comments on that? Um yes, yeah, so, so um I think it's uh <laughs> it's it is perhaps quite ambitious to try and say, well, I mean, the brain's obviously going to be doing things that are a lot more complex, and this is where these uh, more heterogeneous models come into play because you know we're we're assuming that these uh, this topology is is basically the, the only thing that um that is generating the functional connectivity which is you know it's not um that's certainly not the case but i think what we're just trying to do is to um to simplify the model as much as we can so we can get some analytical tractability just to say Okay, we, we can prime the model to excite this eigenmode, which we know is um, pretty important um, in terms of generating, in, in terms of the, the overlap with the functional connectivity. Um, but then once we have that, we can sort of start thinking about adding more ingredients and saying, well, we can we can add things like um, you know th thalamocortical loops, for instance, that that are a lot more important in generating rhythms in the brain. Um, so uh, yeah, we 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 definitely know it's not the full story. It's just uh, a sort of half step into trying to uh, to to um, simulate realistic functional connectivity. Mm. Uh, Jen, do you have a quick question? Hi. Yes. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can compute functional connectivity from neurological data. So how robust are your methods to some of those different approaches? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. Yeah, so there's um, there is lots of different sort of correlations that you can use, um, and we've uh, we've tested a couple. So so we've we, we've used Pearson correlation just on the time series, um, but often we find that um, that sort of washes out a lot of the um, interesting um, correlations you find. Um, because th there's some more interesting correlations, perhaps in different frequency bands. So what we've been trying to do lately is to use uh, amplitude envelope correlation um, within different frequency bands to, um, to see how, how those might correlate better in terms of the, the, um, the eigenmodes we're trying to excite in terms of the, the similarities to uh, functional connectivity. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's lots of different avenues for, for explanation for, for, yeah looking at these things um, and yeah I think there's a, <laughs> there's definitely a lot more we could do further down the line to to um, to 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 test that 